afterwards. So to get us started today, um, I will go through introductions and details before each presentation, but I wanted to ask you a question. So how many of you would agree to the following statement? Uh, pollinators are in trouble. Challenges include changes in climate, pesticides, and lack of human habitat options caused mostly by land use and development. So my poll is not working. <laughs> so just maybe ask yourself that question. Um, and if you do agree, um, that's why we're here today, because uh, based on numerous scientific studies, um, there is a challenge that is facing our pollinators, and we're here today to talk about solutions that, um, that can help this issue. Um, this, the session today has been developed to provide all staff with the information you need um, to understand the program and to support the town's membership in the B City program. We will also provide uh, municipal parks and operations staff with the information to support decision making and on the ground efforts related to the management of any project sites selected for strategic rolling by the town. So a little bit just quickly over the agenda today. Um, so the purpose of uh, part one is to understand uh, why the town has joined the B City program, how it connects to corporate goals, and what are the objectives um, of joining the program. We also want you to appreciate why this work is important. Um, for example, understand the di diversity and value of pollinators, um, how this work benefits these pollinators and provides other values. Uh, we also want to take the opportunity to provide you with information uh, by other municipalities, actions that have taken that they have taken and their commitments um, in no mo no or strategic no projects. In part two, um, we're gonna have a few guests who can introduce you to different approaches to establishing these no mo or strategic mo sites, um, as well um, talk about invasive species um, and monitoring and site management, as well a little bit about the tools that are available to you in order to communicate uh, with your stakeholders and the public. So many of you may be familiar with our services, um, but for some of you, this may be the very first time that you've been introduced to the Southern Sound Environmental Association, who is um, who I work with and who is hosting um, this event today in partnership with the town. So SSCA was developed by municipalities for municipalities to provide the environmental services, services and expertise that you need. We are the environmental and sustainability arm of your municipality here to support you. So since, um, since 2009, we have been a joint municipal services board under the municipal act. So instead of each municipality in the watershed having a separate municipal service board to manage environmental issues, um, we decided to get together um, with those municipalities that are noted at the bottom there um, through their logos to gain efficiency by sharing SSEA as a resource. Uh, we are also your source protection authority under the Clean Water Act. Uh, we are also your associate member to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Partners for Climate Protection Program. And we operate with seven full-time and two part-time staff, as well as uh, we hire on So we provide um, a selection of core and non-core services, some of which include water quality and quantity monitoring, municipal planning support, sewage programming and projects such as our community tree plants, our invasive species removal um, events, as well as our very successful tree distribution program. Uh, we also provide climate change uh, mitigation information, climate change mitigation adaptation information services to support your climate plan implementation. The highlighted service today re relate directly to how we are supporting you in this work. Um, and we have Michelle Huddlin, our wetlands and habitat biologist, as well as Tamara Brinkat, our invasive species coordinator here to share their expertise. So as your moderator today, I'd like to introduce myself um, just to start. I'm the sustainability and climate action coordinator with, with SSEA, responsible for the management of the Sustainable Shepherd Sound Special Project. In my role, I have developed um, the uh, watershed's regional climate plan, municipal level climate plans for our partners, including your respective um, uh, town climate plan. This involved review and approvals by your staff and council, which has allowed your municipality to reach milestone three of the five milestone program. And at this time, my work um, involves supporting our partners in climate plan implementation through information services, research and reporting, and completing annual greenhouse gas analysis for submission and third party review. So just quickly, um, why did the town join the B-City Canada program? So in uh, January 2021, your town was designated as a B-City Canada municipality. 
Um, this occurred after town reached out to SSEA for information um, on how to support a more robust program regarding no mow and strategic mow areas. So we provided you with some options and it was decided by, you, by your staff and council that the BC city membership was a good fit, um, that it connected to multiple corporate goals, including the town's commitment to environmental stewardship, your climate plan, and the goal to reduce fuel use to mitigate greenhouse gases or GHGs. So your park system is extensive. It involves a lot of mowing, which would likely increase um, your greenhouse gases. And this was an option to um, deliver on that, pardon me. So the town um, has selected five sites that would be mown less and monitored throughout the season for growth, the emerging plant community, and the presence of any invasive species that may require intervention. So the town will continue mowing most areas, such as sports and recreation spaces, with only the selected areas designated as these no mow or strategic mow areas. So the, the sites themselves have been selected for their limited public ac access, and they will not interfere in any way with the enjoyment of the town parks and trails. The town is also committed to supporting annual Pollinator Week celebrations, which will occur this year during June 21st to 27th. So your B-City team members will work on this effort and all of these actions will involve community and stakeholder education. So about the benefits, um, it builds on your prior efforts. So previously your council had actually um, proclaimed Pollinator Week in 2017. At that time, you distributed over 250 packets of pollinator-friendly wildflower seeds with support of our project. Um, you also help support a pollinator demonstration garden at the Midland Community Garden, which is available for you to uh, go by and view. So beyond these benefits, um, or these, these, excuse me, these prior efforts, uh, these no mo zones will serve as natural filters to help remove sediment, nutrients, pesticides, and other pollutants from stormwater runoff before they enter uh, local water bodies, thereby protecting water quality. Of course, they'll be providing beneficial habitat, and they will, over time, uh, reduce the resources um, needed to maintain these sites, such as staff time, costs, resources, etc. So I mentioned the B-City team previously, um, and here are the people uh, working on this initiative. So you have town leadership as well as uh, representatives from the SSEA team. I should also note that although he's not a formal member, Randy Fee has been a key player helping move all the communication efforts forward. And this team or the B-City team is here to support you in meeting your B-City program commitments, and we will continue to meet to evaluate progress, plan Pollinator Week events, and celebrate your successes. So now to provide you with some information on pollinators themselves and the B-City program, I'd like to introduce Shelley Kendall. So Shelley is the founder of the B-City Canada program and is a passionate advocate for pollinators. Um, Shelley, so the virtual floor is yours. I will count the first you right know and just take this to, um, to the stuff that you up. Shelly, you're on mute. Thank you. Oh gosh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really grateful and uh, very honored to be here today. Thank you, Tracy, for organizing this wonderful uh, session today. And I'd like to welcome uh, our new Bee City Midland to the Bee City family. So let me just uh, get started here. Uh, whoa. That sorry. Was, oh, that's okay. Was that me? <laughs> No, it was me. <laughs> okay, so I started in 2015 uh, when I found out about Bee City USA under the brilliance of, uh, oh, it just moved. Okay, all right. I guess I need to use my space bar. Sorry about that. I, it wasn't working. Anyways, so it started in, um, it's in 2015 under the, when I learned about Bee City USA under Phyllis Styles. Um, the brilliance of, of, of her organizing BC USA and starting it. So anyways, it brought it to Canada and it really didn't get started until March, 2016 when Toronto voted to become the first B city in Canada. So we move ahead five years later. Uh, there's now 48 B cities, two first nation B cities, uh, schools, campuses, partners, which are businesses, a zoo, a church. Um, uh, really, we are trying to invite all communities to help protect pollinators. Um, so as it started to grow uh, so incredibly big, it was just a little overwhelming for, uh, for myself. 
and uh, I don't I don't really know why it's moving, but <laughs> and uh, so I was looking for uh, the right charity to take it over, and I'm really grateful that I found uh, Vicky and Pollinator Partnership. So she's uh, she's really going to talk about the future of Bee City Canada under her leadership, and I'm going to just talk about right now about my experience and um, and some uh, highlight some incredible things that cities have done across Canada. All right, so the first thing I wanna mention is some incredible things that we have on our website that can help you. So we have a pollinator protection pledge. So that's something that you might wanna use on your on the city website because um, across Canada, not only will you engage the residents that they can become pollinator protectors, but there's resources there, tremendous amount of resources, you know, how, how to plant for pollinators, uh, and also native plant gardens uh, as well. Okay, another thing that we're offering is a 30 minute free online presentations for any grade, any school in your community. So all they have to do is go to this website, sign up and someone will be there live to present to the students. And uh, you know, it's a really, really good city to engage your youth, engage them as much as possible. Something else we have, Gabe, uh, who's here, maybe you wanna just chime in on this, Gabe. So he's our brilliance behind our graphic designer and our website. So we, he created these, uh, these signs, just very simple message, but I think pretty powerful what, it, what a pollinator garden uh, or area looks like. So I don't know, I'd like to introduce Gabe. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, so we have two kinds of signs. The one you're seeing now is a sign for a pollinator garden. So it's just meant to be printed and put uh, in a garden that has native plants and is pesticide free. Um, they're designed so they can be printed on various materials. They can be printed on like as a metal sign or there's also like a durable plastic medium that you can have them printed on and they should last the season. Um, and then we also have our proud to be a bee city signs. Um, which we have a generic version where you can just post them around letting people know that uh, Midland has become a bee city or we can actually customize the sign with the Midland logo and then you can post it in various public spaces and things like that just to promote your that you're a bee city. Great thank you Gabe. Okay so this is what Toronto ha had done when they became a B city. They put this big mural up and use art. Art is a really great way to educate people by, now this is sweat bee. Um, uh, this is uh, the bee that Toronto chose as their mascot. So here's some city signage. It's a great way to educate people. So you see, this is a new market. They have their B city sign that they're a B city. And I really encourage uh, you to do the same. And these are some signs from our First Nation communities. They put theirs up right away. They were just so proud to become a bee city. Um, and they're, uh, they're, both these communities are in British Columbia. So this is what St. Catharines had done to promote that they were a bee city, this beautiful floral garden with our logo, the bee, Kortha Lake, and uh, oh, oops, <laughs> uh, it wasn't moving, sorry, oh, and Guelph, I love it, this was the B. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, West Queen West, uh, so this is a business improvement association, so as you can see, so this is downtown Toronto, Queen Street, you know, well, well, we, we all remember those days, but it will happen again, so as you can see all these planters, um, you know, full of pollinators, full of bees, no one got stung and it was beautiful. Like you can see the beauty of, of, of this. These are all edible plants. Um, and, then, uh, and then they had uh, some bees, bee houses on top. And you, so you can see they had fun with playing with the words Airbnb, of course. So this is, uh, so this is something in Clearwater, British Columbia. They had a parade and you see how they activate, the students got involved and there's a little dog dressed up as a bee. So, you know, have fun. So this is something from the city of Brandon. So um, they wanted people to vote on who their official bee would be. So it was a brilliant campaign. And so they used three bees and uh, they used uh, leaf cutter bee, 
a sweat bee and a, uh, a kind of bumblebee. And so it was a way to educate people, have fun, engage people, and they got a lot of great press out of it. This was the, the article that was in the Brandon paper with the photo. Okay, this is in Calgary. Um, so whenever they were gonna do an area and restore it, um, they would have these little, little bots there. I don't know what you call them. And so this is the male bee. And uh, I thought it was just such a brilliant idea because of course it's fun, it educates people and it goes along with the sign, but of course you need the girl bee too. So they created one uh, for a girl as well. Um, and so uh, my, the message is pretty clear. It's just be friendly, engage as many people as you can in this and have fun. You know, it, it's not about telling them the disaster out there. I mean, do we wanna tell people that monarchs are almost close to extinction? I, I don't really think so. Um, I mean, people want to know the truth, but I think we really just have to engage people, create beauty in their gardens, create beauty in our cities, and uh, I think that will be the change. And I have to stop with, this is near the end of the little joke, because I love the little bee jokes and the bee puns. So these are two bees talking to each other, and it says, want to listen to some music? I've got Bebop, Beethoven, Beyonce, The Beatles, Beastie Boys, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Justin Bieber. So the other bee says, do you have anything from Sting? So I love the little jokes. So I'm gonna, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, as I said, I'll let Vicki talk about the future and and we have some other BCs here as well. Okay. All right, does anyone have any um, specific questions for, um, I'm gonna move up. Sorry if people can't hear me, I apologize. It wasn't, uh, Unfortunately, with, with transferring the screen, you can actually see the chat. So if people are trying to get to me, unfortunately, it would require me to then take over the screen. So apologies. But thanks very much for your presentation. All great um, inspirational um, examples of what can be done. But um, yeah, if you do have a question for, um, for Shelley, we have a couple minutes. That was only about eight and a half minutes, Shelley, so we do have some time. Um, you can either unmute yourself um, or type in the chat box if you do have any questions. Okay, so I, I'll just, well, I've got another minute. So I'll just say this. So the three things are to educate and you can do that with signage, making it fun to educate. And uh, celebration, of course, is important. Of course, planting, we know that's obvious as well, so. And I think there's, um, I don't know if you've had the opportunity, anyone at this point um, to, probably not, but um, to actually visit the Bee City Canada website, but it is, um, it, as, Shelly was saying it's full of resources. There's webinars you can watch, there's documents, there's kids crafts, um, there's, there's all kinds of things on there that you can access. So. All right, thanks very much, um, Shelly. So at this point, um, I'd like to uh, go right into our municipal examples. Um, so we have uh, three municipalities who are with us today who have um, agreed to share their experiences as Bee City municipalities and examples of NOMO and naturalization projects that, um, that they've been working on. Um, they're also gonna provide you uh, with some, kind of some top lessons learned that you can consider as you move forward in your efforts. Um, keep in mind, most of these municipalities are working on these initiatives for multiple years. Um, this is an opportunity for you to see the opportunities and you know, maybe think about what would be something that uh, your town would like to work on as well or something that you could make your own. So I'm going to at this time then uh, transfer the control to Jay. So just a little bit of an intro for Jay. So Jay grew up in rural Wellington County. He became very interested in nature and ecology, botany and horticulture at an early age. Following his initial education, early in his career he took part in a project with the town of Caledon Parks Department studying alternatives to mown turf and park settings, which led to a pilot park natural naturalization program. After successful years of consulting, Jay joined the City of Guelph's Parks Operations team in 2019 as a natural area stewardship technician and has a variety of roles in community stewardship and liaison, community gardens, trails, and ecological restoration. 
On any day, Jay might be working on projects of varying scale from citywide master planning to looking at individual sites at a greater level of detail as part of planning individual naturalization projects with key partners and interest groups. Welcome, Jay. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Can everybody uh, everybody hear me? Uh, Trace, if you can just give me a nod. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yes, thanks for thanks for the invitation. This is a it's a great forum, and and I'm excited to to share uh, some of the things that Guelph has done over the years to uh, develop the the programs that we're running now. And I think uh, in order to put this into context, I'm going to provide a little bit of information on kind of where we've been, where we are today, and uh, where we're uh, seeing ourselves going in the future. Um, and just to kind of set things in context, I, I dug up some old air photos, and it really does help to illustrate some of the changes that have taken place over time. So there's a, a red star at one of the intersections, and that, that's kind of the point of focus for a couple of slides that I want to show you. Here is 1955. So this would be the year after Hurricane Hazel, and I really wanted to focus on the Speed River. So you can see how it's got a meander in it here, and things are quite natural um, in some locations along the river. Um, so fast forward to 1965, and you no notice a huge difference. Um, the river's been straightened out, the meander's gone, um, there are flood control facilities in place, um, some of the tributaries that led into the river have been buried partially. Um, but the real kind of key thing here is looking at the edge. I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but literally the rivers were mown right to the edge um, all the way along the, the two key river systems um, in the city. And this is uh, that same location, an aerial of what it looks like today. Um, so you'll notice that we have a, you know, we've got a nice trail system on both sides, but really the key here is this big buffer that is um, between the trail uh, and the river. And that is um, one of the key areas of our naturalization program and really one of the key areas that, that the program started um, in the city. And if you look at it today or visit that area today, you'd be hard pressed to know that you know, at one point in time, it was mown right to the river. Um, there's trail system on both sides. Um, a lot of places that the trail has a canopy that's developed, um, so you're walking in shade, and you really, I mean, you know the river's there, but you can't see clear to it. Um, the photo in the top right-hand corner, if uh, if if that was back in 1960s, um, you would have been able to see right clear to the river's edge, but it's really matured um, um, over time. So um, as Tracy pointed out, we've been at this for a while at the city of Guelph. Um, there was some initial policy developed in the early 90s, and it really was um, to try to start, start to take some steps on naturalization and to explore that as a city. And the policy was based on the best practices um, of the day. So here we're thinking about best practices back in the 1980s. Um, and really what it set out to do was, was to characterize all of our different parks um, according to some different maintenance classes. Um, so what was called natural landscapes, primary landscapes, open space areas, and recreational tourism landscapes. And the natural landscapes and the open space areas were really the ones that were I guess, subject to or eligible for um, the naturalization program. And um, in those areas, the approaches looked at um, natural regeneration. So basically letting things go and go on their own, managing succession where we go in and plant certain species to help move um, plant communities along um, the timeline from early stages of succession into later six stages of succession. And then plantation, where we're going in and simply planting an area with a with a single or a couple of species to, to sort of create that transition. There was a lot of staff um, education that went along um, with that, so that when staff was out and, and they could answer questions that people had, um, we had a lot of public engagement back in the day. There were open houses, there were notices in, in the leisure guide, um, and and the example, the graphic example, kind of shows how parks were characterized. So taking those different zones and and applying them, so you can see that the the recreation landscape was the ball field, and and areas around there were dedicated for, for different um, um, levels of, um, of maintenance. Uh, 
And we did learn, there was a lot of things that were learned. Um, one of the key things was developing buffer strips between um, residential properties and the natural landscape. So instead of having it running right up to the fence and creeping into neighbors' yards, um, the idea was to create that buffer strip that remains mown so that it, it's sort of in a sense controlling um, anything from moving into, into yards. Transitions, so rather than going from a, um, a, a three inch grass directly into a, a very tall landscape, there was different mow sites mo heights that were set in order to create those transition turn transitions and then also um, signage and communication really really important um, to be able to answer questions um, that people have and really communicate the goals of, of the program so that was then um, today um, you know, it's really embedded in our policy today at all levels, all the way from our official plan and, and strategic plan right down into various action plans that really give staff um, the, the assignments that they need to do in order to carry out the goals that are established in those higher level plans. So it's really, it's come a long ways in terms of the policy. Just wanted to highlight a few of the programs that, that focus a bit or that are related a bit to, to naturalization and, and no mo. So we have a, what's called a healthy landscape program where um, a residential landowner can have a 45 minute visit free of charge from um, folks in, in, very, in, in a couple of our departments where they're basically um, on their property just to give them some thoughts and ideas on how they can transition their own property to make it um, less intensive from, from the water use point of view, um, more naturalized, better for pollinator species, uh, implanting native species, and so on. Um, we also have a fairly um, um, active community gardens program that's been running for 10 years, and it includes both traditional community gardens uh, where people are growing vegetables and, and some food, food um um, trees and so on, but it also includes our pollinator gardens. So everything from um, the pollinator uh, feature on the roof of City Hall right down to what we call pollinator pockets um, in our various community gardens. Uh, we have an, uh, an invasive management um, program for uh, several species. Um, our main focus is on buckthorn and part of that um, is, you know, I have to admit that we do get buckthorn coming into those NOMO areas, um, but we've got a, a pretty intensive and aggressive program that is underway to help to manage, uh, to manage those. And then now what we're doing is we're going back and planting into those spaces where the buckthorns have been managed out to, uh, to, to try to stop um, future reinvasion of the buckthorn. Um, in, in 2019, we, we piloted a, a native pollinator program where we're using a space in our greenhouse that was normally dedicated to growing uh, more traditional bedding plants and we're working closely with our horticulture department um, to grow and be able to distribute some native pollinator species um, through our own planting programs, um, to our community gardens, to our community planting efforts and so on. And one of the things that we discovered here based on you know, strong policy work in the past was that we have this fantastic um, seed source right in our own backyard. Once we, you know, got to looking at it closely and identifying the species, we've got more than enough there than, than we can collect um, and grow um, and distribute on an annual basis. Um, last year, because of COVID, we ended up with, with lots of extra plants that were, were slated for community garden, for community planting programs. So we offered them up to our community gardens and um, the uptake was huge. Um, they pretty much all the gardens wanted plants. Um, they planted pollinator patches and strips around their gardens to help with um, fertilization of, of their vegetables, but also our community gardens really recognized the value of pollinators and, and they were delighted to have that opportunity. I wanted to uh, kind of give you a, a, a little brief on a particular program that, that we have in one area of the city. And this was a hydro corridor that um, Hydro One um, decided that they needed to manage out the uh, the understory that was underneath the wires um, and gave the city very little notice uh, when this was going to take place. Um, they basically told us on a Friday, um, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but they told us on a Friday and then they came in on Monday and and leveled the entire corridor and the public outrage was, was unbelievable. Um, 
what the public did not know, um, and through some careful education and, and stick handling and so on, was that what was cut out was primarily buckthorn. So what they thought was this, um, you know, pristine forest area really was a mass of invasive species. So that was that was managed out, and we were able to kind of turn the take the negative and turn it into a positive, and it was turned into a pollinator corridor. So it was seeded with an appropriate native species. Um, here's a shot of it back in June of last year with the, the penstemon, the digitalis in, in full bloom. And it really is a wonderful space that, that people, uh, that residents really value now. They understand what was there before. They understand what was there, what's there now and, and what, great, what a great change it has been. Our, um, our partners are, uh, are gold. Um, this is, you know, of, of the lessons learned, this is definitely one of our lessons and that is, you know, find your partners and, and really support them wherever you can. And that's what we do. Um, we do some of our own planting events, but we really tend to support our partners like Pollination Guelph, um, Trees for Guelph, another localization, local organization that over um, the last uh 30 years has planted 150,000 trees and shrubs um, in the city. They also plant uh, pollinators and they do a lot of stewardship work with local businesses, with the community, and in particular with local schools. So they get out um, with the kids, get them planting, um, and they learn and, and they become enthusiastic. And a lot of those projects are done in their schoolyards or in the park spaces that, are, that share common boundaries with the schools. Um, in terms of looking ahead, so um, we still have lots of work to do. We've done a lot in the past, but um, we, we've got a, a newly approved um, urban forest management plan that has a, a canopy goal that takes us from 23% canopy cover to a target of 40%. So we have a lot of work to do to, to add to our naturalization areas, also go back in and infill areas that we lost due to the emerald ash borer. Um, so there's a lot of um, coordination and work that has to be done there. And one of the other things that we have developed as a part of that coordination effort is what we call the Ecological Restoration Implementation Committee. And it's an internal committee that, uh, that I'm the chair of. Uh, and it, we have representatives from uh, various levels of policy planning, parks planning, operations, and so on. And it really is a way for us to communicate internally, um, set our priorities, identify areas, um, species that we're going to use, who's going to do the planting. Is it going to be um, you know, our own city crews? Is it going to be our forestry folks? Is it going to be uh, through volunteers? So it really is a way to... Um, to coordinate, get everybody on the same page um, and, and set priorities and kind of put those plans into action. The other thing that, we, uh, that we're embarking on in a more aggressive uh, manner in the next few years is having our own planting crew. So rather than just supporting um, um, community plantings, we actually are going to have some dedicated staff that are going to be out implementing um, plans for some of those areas that, um, that we are, are, are examining. And the other uh, great lesson that we've learned um, is to use the power of, of data. Um, we've got a really fantastic infrastructure database in GIS that, that all the departments um, have access to. Um, so what we're using it for specific to the naturalization program is it's partly that inter interface with uh, policy planning and natural heritage planning. But we're able to um, go out and... Um, and literally map where we've been. So one of my projects since starting at this job has, has been looking at the city sort of at the 30,000 from the 30,000 um, foot point of view and mapping all the work, all the locations, the work that's done be, been done before with invasive species management, um, as well as naturalization planting. So it gives us a picture of our past, which is something that we never really had. Um, it was all sort of distributed among files and so on, but now we have this really great picture. And it's been, um, you know, we're directly importing that into our GIS. And from that, we can use that um, to, to calculate metrics. So, for example, we know, um, and when I learned this figure, um, I was quite shocked. We know that it costs, uh, on an annual basis, 67 cents per square meter to maintain turf. So quite apart from, you know, all of the other benefits, um, we're looking to areas in our park systems where we can improve some of those operational efficiencies, where the parks team is 
uh, mowing on steep slopes um, in between a lot of trees, you know, great candidates for naturalization. Um, so it's going to save some time. It's going to save, um, you know, carbon emissions. Um, and at the same time, it's a way for our departments to, to work together and improve those efficiencies. So um, in summary, uh, you know, Guelph has been at it for a number of years. Um, um, we've learned a lot along the way about, um, you know, about partnerships, about managing um, communications, about, you know, being ready for people that are not um, going to be aligned in, in terms of what the goals are and, and really helping them understand. Um, and we've got a long way to go uh, to, to keep on moving with it. So um, it's been a great program. I really enjoy it and I look forward to seeing it, uh, you know, continue to grow uh, in the future. Thanks very much. Wow, excellent. Thanks so much, Jay. Um, some great points there, um, especially about um, trying to integrate the data, um, your seed banks, as well as, um, you know, we have a similar um, guide, I think it's called North Simcoe um, Recreation Guide, but putting something in there about um, what the town's doing in regards to this program, I think will be really helpful as well to get us started. So thank you for sharing your experience. I really appreciate it. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions for Jay, you can either uh, put those in the chat um, to me or you can um, unmute yourself and, and ask directly if you like. Okay, great. I'm not getting any questions at any time as well. Um, I know the speakers have open have said to me that um, you're welcome to contact, contact them directly with any questions, um, examples, um, of their programs, um, further information. So uh, please feel free to do that as well. And as I said, we will be sharing this presentation with you afterwards. So thanks again, Jay. So um, now I'd like to welcome um, Stephanie Weidman. So Stephanie is the Parks Program Coordinator um, with the uh, City of Barrie. Um, so with the City of Barrie, she works on the Community Gardens Program, the Parks Related Educational Outreach and Partnerships uh, Programs. She has worked with the City of Victoria, the Township of King, and has over 18 years experience in the Municipal Parks field. She has an Associate Diploma in Horticulture from the University of Guelph and is an ISA Arborist and Tree Risk Assessor. Currently, she is obtaining a Professional Certificate in Ecological Restoration through the University of Victoria and she loves to spend time in her own garden, out in the forest, and with her family. So thanks for joining us, Stephanie, and I'll just transfer the screen sharing to you now, okay? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Let me just, uh, oops, saying, uh, yeah, whenever you are. Yeah, you should be able to just take control, I believe is what we did before. It says uh, you cannot share the screen while other participant is sharing. Okay, me, I'll just stop my share. Okay, and then you go ahead. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Great. Okay, well, thank you, Tracy. Um, uh, hi, my name is Stephanie Weidman, and uh, I'm program, Parks Program Coordinator with the City of Barrie. First, I want to thank uh, Sustainable Severn Sound and the Town of Midland for this opportunity to be included in this workshop today. As we work towards our goals, today is an opportunity to realize that we're not doing this on our own. We don't have to start from scratch. And these workshops are critical for building partnerships and strengthening collaborations. Pollinators don't know where the town lines are. They're relying on us to work together. And today I wanna to share with you our experience as a bee city for the past couple of years with a look ahead to what we're working on. So here's just a quick overview of uh, what I'd like to cover today. Uh, it's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, but I'll just try to briefly touch on all these components. So we became a bee city in 2019, which stemmed from a combination of parks and forestry staff, community blooms committee, and proactive residents who had heard about Bee City Canada, which resulted in a direct motion from council. We focused our first year efforts on these areas, our people. We provided education and training for staff, and from there we developed a cross-functional staff team. So that involved parks and forestry, our communications, the event staff, um, that sort of thing. And uh, we all had uh, active management support and a strong vision. So, and our projects. 
we had too many to name here today, but our big ones included some shoreline restoration work, conversion of annual to native plants, and expansion of naturalized areas, and our partners, building relationships, increasing our educational outreach with residents, businesses, and community organizations was a huge building block. COVID paused most of our B city work. Everyone had a shift in demand and priorities, but we did what we could to keep the momentum going. We had planned a ton of pollinator events, um, but instead we held an online contest where people submitted their photos and our judges picked the best one. They won a butterfly house that was created for another event that was canceled. Uh, but this was our first online virtual event. And now we feel that this will be a component for not only this year ahead, but for many to come. We had a great response and it was excellent to build a catalog of photos because we got so many great shots. So let's get into the NOMO conversation. This article came out last January talking about naturalization of Allendale Station Park, which is on the South Shore at Kempenfeld Bay. It's around 16 hectares of parkland that is popular with both walkers and nature lovers. And it's an excellent candidate for this type of project. This is a great example of a volunteer driven initiative. People are demanding more for their public spaces and are willing to put in the work. And it's important to engage it with all the stakeholders in this conversation and this project's in the process of doing just that. So here's a part of Allendale Station Park. Isn't it a beautiful example of natural beauty? It doesn't need to be kept in a constant state of cut. One thing that we noticed were how many calls out came in about people expressing thanks for leaving the dandelions. They know that they're critical for pollinators, especially at the time of year when there's not very many other flowers blooming. Yeah, we still got lots of complaints, but people were overwhelmed by the circumstances and were going out into nature and viewing their life in our outdoor spaces differently. COVID showed us the value of these outdoor spaces. And COVID also limited our seasonal staff returns and reallocated resources that changed our turf maintenance practices. We prioritized the central waterfront and from there we identified sections of community and neighborhood parks where we could cut down the frequency of mowing. By evaluating our mowing regime, we can better utilize our resources to tackle other projects at hand. With better scheduling and site management, we reduce the rate of mowing by two days every two weeks. This was done by alternate, alternating cut areas in each park on a rotation cycle, monitoring the growth rate rates and waiting to cut until later in the season. Time gained by reduced mowing was used to complete other projects. People think that no mow means no maintenance, but that is nothing, nothing is maintenance free. Picking up litter is much harder to do in long grass and invasive species is always a problem. By calculated mowing times, we can achieve controls in a more effective way. So this is an example of one of our lessons learned. Take lots of pictures. I think everyone was just so focused at the task at hand that we really didn't get a lot of um, good pictures of the various uh, mow heights this year. So uh, kind of what, referring to what Jay was talking about, um, we use our pa uh, parks classification system as a starting point to go through the parks, identifying areas that we could stop cutting. And one of the ways we did this was by utilizing GIS mapping. We also looked at what other municipalities were doing in their approach. And we used various guidelines to narrow the scope, such as slope, proximity to buffer zones, and, and that sort of thing. So this photo was McConkie Park in the south end of Barrie that has a lot of low lying areas that were identified in GIS to take off the NOMO list. We have utilized NOMO for a while to a certain extent, but COVID really brought this to the forefront. It was also noted that you can't just evaluate the land sitting at the, a desk. It's important to go out and inspect the area before no mowing occurs because it can be difficult to identify hazards after the grass has grown long and sight lines have changed. Crews look for hazards, which include large objects, holes, stumps, that sort of stuff. And this ensures that we can safely allow no mowing to commence. And this is especially important in areas that haven't um, been naturalized before. So our staff has a lot of site specific knowledge. And by gathering that information, we can identify the reasons why areas should be cut or naturalized. Work often continues because that's the way we've done it in the past. And sometimes there's a concrete reason to be doing that, but sometimes we're just going through the motions. We need to understand and reevaluate our cutting criteria. 
So a collaborative approach, which helps staff to be a part of the process, can understand why we are cutting or why, why we're not cutting. And in turn, we are all more informed when we're speaking with the public. We want to expand on our site evaluations, especially for areas earmarked for heavier restoration work. And uh, this photo here represents one of our first experiments in Sunnydale Park, where we naturalized and supplemented the area with native plants that had a high ornamental value. So with our detailed evaluations, we can identify areas and purposely plant to naturalize and support of pollinators. And we are working towards renovations by removing the turf and replanting with native species, creating basically a designer ecosystem in the park that can be a naturalized pollinator patch. We're now in that initial phase of looking how we're gonna achieve this. So here's a photo of a, pa a past project from quite some time ago, uh, but we are using uh, this to kind of look and reevaluate our programs. So public perception is influential. How do we change that viewpoint that naturalization means unkempt? How do we change the norm of highly manicured grass is the set standard for all parkland? This is why taking measured steps in a thoughtful way will help the public understand that mowing constantly is not the most economical or beneficial to our environment. I think that this can be achieved by starting small, taking baby steps in unprogrammed areas of the park. This shows that it can be done in a purposeful way that can also be pleasing to the eye. And then we can tackle the large areas because we practice in the lower, lower use, smaller areas. It's just that gentle change of the comfort levels. And education outreach is essential. People need to learn why naturalization is important and beneficial. And this is why by focusing our education on efforts to children, we can shift the culture and have that upward movement of knowledge while they engage in active participation. Our outreach effort is a critical part of our initiative. So in 2021, we are building on our policy framework that will support naturalization and other strategies identified under the B-City umbrella. Becoming a B-City provides a level of commitment to sustain policy direction and maintain programming support. The City of Barrie is currently updating its official plan and it's timely to evaluate at a high level our long-term goals of naturalization. This will support future land use decisions and make our parks open spaces and greenways more connected, resilient, sustainable, and adaptable. The City of Barrie developed this policy, naturalization policy, over 20 years ago, and it was defined by maintenance standards in parks classifications that are, will be out of date with the new OP. We adapted the climate change adaption strategy in 2017, and B City touches on multiple targets in that. The Boulevard Planting Policy and Property Standards Bylaws support deliberate plantings of natural gardens that are curated with intent and managed to the same degree as manicured turf areas. This framework in place leverages community engagement by allowing property owners to install alternatives and by following these non-standard landscape treatment guidelines. These guidelines help ensure safety is maintained and encourages resident, residents to choose the appropriate plant material to achieve these goals. And we're looking to close those gaps this year. With the changes to park use and having the proper policy in place, we can move ahead and we are very proud to be a B-City. By taking baby steps, we can slowly help the public perception come around to understand what naturalization really means and what it can look like. Planning and evaluations are the most important part of restoration work. As much as we'd like to jump in immediately, it's a very important to complete this piece. And even with all our setbacks from COVID, we intend to accomplish as much as possible by the way of collaboration and working together with the community. So I just want to acknowledge all of your hard work invested in this important mission and I thank you for your time today. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for attending. That was great information. Um, and it's nice to know that one of our closer neighbors as well is working on similar initiatives and um, will likely be in touch soon. So thank you very much for your time. Um, does anyone have any specific uh, questions for Stephanie at this time? I have just a quick question, um, maybe to um, 
to Stephanie and to Jay. Just uh, just wondering if you get if you have support from the city councilors and if that makes a difference and how do you feel it's important to engage the city councilors in what you're doing? Yeah, I we definitely have support from council. Um, actually, it was Councillor Mike McCann in our in our city who uh, was really the face of this uh, B City initiative in 2019. And uh, through all of our decision making processes, they're always kept in the loop of what we're doing, and uh, they are all aware of how much interest and how important it is. So it's it's critical to have them um, aware of what's going on and uh, and to to be uh, understanding of our role. And I yeah I would echo um, Stephanie's comments as well that that our council is is aware uh, and engaged. Um, you know we know that they've got lots of other responsibilities and so on, um, and especially with all of the communication work that they were so inundated with over the past year that was totally different than anything that they're used to. We did um, kind of back off a little bit on some of that just to not overwhelm them, but um, you know, we're certainly accessible as staff to them. We keep them in the loop um, and, you know, they really recognize the importance of um, not only what the program, the B-City program represents, but but what naturalization and 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 so on, um, you know, environmental um, protection and, and enhancement, um, they they recognize its value at a bunch of different levels for sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Or I think we're thank you for those responses. Um, so I, th I guess we'll get going. We are a few minutes behind, but we do have some time for a. Um, a break in between so we can always catch up. Sorry, as Stephanie was sharing. Oh. Okay. Um, so for our, um, our last uh, municipal example, we have Steve Hasselman, who's the superintendent of parks uh, north with the city of Hamilton. Um, so Steve is a certified horticultural technician He's the owner operator, prior to that, he was the owner operator of a landscape, landscape construction and maintenance company um, before joining the city of Hamilton. Um, he's been with the city for approximately 10 years, working his way up from gardener, supervisor, and now superintendent, and has been in this role for the past um, six years. Oops, sorry, I'm just going to share this with you now. There you go. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, Tracy. Um, so, like uh, you said, I'm Steve Hasselman. I work for the city of Hamilton. The city is divided up into four districts, uh, and I specifically take care of the uh, downtown area, uh, so all the uh, urban parks. Um, let's see here. Let's see if this works. Perfect. Um, there we go. So our city of Hamilton strategic plan uh, our vision is to be the best place to raise a child in age successfully, uh, but more specifically from an environmental uh, perspective, uh, we focus on our clean and green initiatives and community engagement and participation. Uh, we found uh, uh, the best success we've had with this program is definitely uh, with our community engagement and ensuring that, uh, that we support them uh, in any way possible. I just wanted to start with uh, an example of community engagement. So in the upper picture is an example of a community garden. Um, obviously, most of you know what that is, where uh, we have residents take care of, uh, of gardens uh, for growing food. And uh, we find they to be the biggest advocates of bees within our parks. Uh, so they're gonna be your best friends. And already having community groups uh, involved and in these areas help with uh, supporting the cause. As well, we also uh, are heavily involved with the Hamilton Naturalist Club and Environment Hamilton. And together they've been working really hard on this Pollinators Paradise Project, where they're basically creating a corridor of pollinator sites from uh, one end of the city across to the other. So uh, I've worked really, uh, uh, I've been very involved with them in identifying sites uh, within the downtown area to create this corridor and just to have a full connection uh, across the city. Um, another way we uh, engage with community, we run a, a bunch of programs. Adopt a Park is one where just uh, a group of community members uh, can adopt a park within 
uh, uh, close to uh, to their houses and as a group, whether it be a business or uh, or just some neighbors. Uh, and we find that's been a really successful program as far as uh, plantings and parks, uh, mulching beds, weeding, um, and maintaining these sites that would otherwise be very difficult uh, for our staff to uh, to maintain. Um, also with community engagement, I wanted to point out, uh, we do a lot of community events where uh, when we do a renovation of a park or we're uh, redesigning or building a new park, uh, what we like to do uh, through our LAS teams or our landscape architectural services team, we'll come in with uh, drawings uh, and features that we want to put into parks. And we've been including no mow zones as areas uh, within those parks that people can vote on where they want to see it. Um, it's already just engaging the public within that neighborhood to understand that this is coming. Uh, so it's no surprise. Um, and that's your opportunity to, uh, to educate. So here's a good example of a uh, successful NOMO area that we've, uh, it's been established at least 10 years now. Um, you can see uh, within the red area that I've circled uh, is the NOMO zone. Um, it borders the, the, the uh, forested area. Um, you can see there's, there's very limited houses in the area, just in the bottom corner there, uh, which is good. So you're, you're not gonna get complaints about the area looking unkempt. Uh, as well as if you look in the center of that picture, you'll see that it's almost like a postage stamp and those are community gardens. So another example of where we have stewardship in the neighborhood. Uh, and these are your best friends when it comes to early spring cleanups, um, as far as cleaning up waste and litter within these areas. Um, and, uh, uh, and just overall support. So obviously from an operational point of view, there's huge cost savings because we're, uh, we're not cutting these on a, on a regular rotation. Uh, definitely a benefit to the environment. Um, even with our forestry department, uh, forestry right now within the city of Hamilton is looking at, uh, they're looking at increasing the canopy as our most municipality. So these are great opportunities and great spots where they can plant trees that won't be affected by um, weed whackers, mowers, and uh, damage from, uh, from that type of work. Uh, so these are, these are great areas and trees can grow kind of on their own. Um, this is an example of a no mow area that's right downtown Hamilton. Um, so in this case here, uh, we've got the outlined red area. So the no mow areas in the center there, you got the houses. We found for this to be successful, it really helps to have a manicured section in between to kind of create a little bit of a buffer. Uh, we do get a lot of complaints about uh, insects. Ticks are big right now in Hamilton. Um, so right away when people see unkempt areas, that's what they automatically go to. They see the negative impacts. Um, the below picture is just uh, a picture of it. You can see we've added a lot of shrubbery and a lot of uh, different color type plant material just to dress it up a little bit. And then you can also see signage is really key. And you'll see in my next picture here, I, I zoomed in, you can see it's good to have a, uh, a clear def definition, like I said, between the, uh, the houses and, uh, and the naturalized area. Um, making sure lots of signage, identifying um, basically what types of plant material are there, what it's for, the purpose. Uh, we find that's really helped with public engagement. Um, and then in this case, picking this site, and I'll just go back uh, on the below, area there, you can see there's a railway track. So uh, before that area was established, those houses would just be looking right at trains, ugly, you know, the railway tracks, a bunch of weeds. So by establishing this garden here, and you can see in the below picture, it's well established now, just something nice for the residents and, uh, and uh, just getting their support so we don't get complaints. Uh, lessons learned. I mentioned earlier about deer ticks. That's a big uh, rise in Hamilton now. So, um, for us, it's very important to have a lot of signage, uh, warning people that ticks are present, having those buffers of mowed areas uh, for people to walk to create that separation helps. Um, just educating people, making sure they understand to look for ticks on their animals, on themselves. Um, getting staff to understand the boundaries. I've had two instances in smaller parks where staff mowed right over those uh, uh, pollinator gardens that were just starting to establish. And I find uh, specifically when you're just starting out, it's really important to educate your own staff as well as uh, uh, the signage and identifying the locations. So we've gone uh, full tilt into mapping and making sure we map out areas that are to be maintained and aren't uh, using GIS just to help our staff. Um, getting the community to accept the appearance and understanding the purpose, that's where signage helps. Um, one large problem that's happening in Hamilton and, and other municipalities obviously is we are seeing an increase in our homeless 
uh, uh, population as well. People are moving out, uh, people are struggling. So they do find these uh, naturalized areas as being more so out of the way and an easy place to kind of disappear or hide so that people don't bother them. Uh, so to tackle that, uh, we've actually worked on, as soon as we see a site like this, uh, we try and uh, engage right away and send our outreach team and, and help with uh, services and provide support. Because the longer that these individuals are in these sites, uh, they're going to start damaging naturalized areas. It's going to damage the vegetation. Um, there's always potential for a fire risk, uh, as well as uh, just, just garbage in general uh, collecting over time. Like I said, they can't really help that, but uh, so we, we do our best to engage right away. Uh, another lesson learned, um, make sure you pick your, your, your locations wisely. So here's just a spot that was just a little bit too wet. They couldn't mow and then staff just kind of assumed, well, you know what? Why don't we just leave this naturalized? Uh, you can see the areas of grass. I can tell you when you don't educate people and you just kind of pick and choose, it doesn't go over too well. The baseball community here uh, was not appreciative of this initiative and they'll come up with any excuse, whether it's their kids sitting on the bleachers, getting bitten by mosquitoes, or if it's the tick population again, or just anything, right? They'll come up with an excuse. So picking your locations uh, very strategically is, is, is a wise move. Um, I just wanted to share one example of a really successful location. Like I said, this is pretty well downtown. It's about uh, 30 seconds from right downtown Hamilton. This was a green space that we didn't actually uh, have a use for just being cut. There's no uh, playgrounds here. There's no reason why uh, something can't happen here, right? So this is a picture of that area now redeveloped. So this was in collaboration with the Hamilton Naturalist Club. They did all the planting design. We offered our suggestions um, for something like this. It was very important that the gardens are contained. Uh, so we have borders around them we asked for. So it'd be easy to cut grass around them. Uh, we asked for uh, enough separation between the beds that mowers can easily cut. So there is obviously a little bit more weed trimming here, but that's not really a big issue. Um, as far as containing the plants themselves so they don't spread within the grassy area. And um, even just from a um, cosmetic point of view, uh, even if you have some pollinators, they, they kind of look like weeds. People aren't too happy with it, at least in a contained area. You can see the site does look very alive and very clean. And I think that's really helped. And one thing I want to point out too, you can see there's a signage in the front. Um, as well as there's a giant mural in the back and my next uh, picture is going to show that. So this mural here, um, hold on a sec. Let's see, it's not going to the next picture. Oh, there we go. Oh, my bad. I'll go back. My computer froze. <laughs> You know, when you click something 10 times in a row, right? So. Okay, hopefully that stops. Did you want me to go back to the, here? Yeah, it kind of froze on me. Sorry, I was almost yeah, done there. Sorry about, no. Oh, there we go. Uh, that looks like my stuff again. Good. Okay, so I'll let it freeze. I'll stop sporadically hitting buttons for a second here. So anyways, just speaking to that mural, <laughs> which I'll show in a second here, once I got it figured out. Um, so that mural was actually designed by a local artist and that local artist engaged a school that's actually just down the street of elementary kids. And so those kids and with that artist, they designed that and then the kids actually helped paint the mural and then our staff supported it by, uh, by actually installing the mural on that site. So hopefully it'll show up in a second here and one more. So this was actually really good for, here we go. So this was actually really good for PR. So the artist designed it, the kids helped paint it. Um, we had a big uh, to do with this. The media came out, the mayor was there and all the kids from the school came out. And this was really good for public engagement. We brought the neighbors out around the area. So this was the first step to developing that site. And then from there, we did all the planting that you saw in the previous picture. So like I said, huge success, the media, you know, from a, from a, a media perspective, very positive outcome. And then it really, this is an entrance way into the city. So people see this and they think, oh, that's cool. Right. So it really just gets people talking and interested. Uh, so next step. So just finally uh, a little project we're working on. And I saw this in a previous presentation as well, is we're looking at developing this hydro corridor here. Uh, same thing, just overseeding with some uh, pollinator type plants, some, uh, some, some uh, seed mix. 
Um, so the residents in this area would be already uh, used to uh, low levels of service. So this area only gets cut maybe once or twice a year. So we've been engaging with hydro to see if we can start uh, throwing down a natural seed mix. So it would be a great corridor to have. And then in the bluish greenish area down below, there's two small squares. That's where we want to uh, develop a new community garden as well. There's your stewards. They can uh, uh, work in their community garden. We got water nearby. As long as you su uh, supply things like water to them, uh, support them when they have cleanups where we, uh, we, we clean up behind them, throwing out waste and whatnot, uh, supplying wood chips, anything they ask for, we kind of supply. And, uh, and it's, just, it's just collaboration with these groups, which is really important. So next steps, that's kind of what we're working on. And finally, um, that's it. I just wanted to point out a couple of things that everybody else, like I'm just basically mirroring the other presentations, make sure there's lots of signage, community engagement, uh, making sure your staff are on board and know what they're supposed to do and what not to do. And uh, like I said, that's worked good for us. Uh, and then uh, uh, lots of uh, bring the media in whenever you can. I find that's actually really helped. And we engage with the counselors in the area as well beforehand uh, when redesigning parks and whatnot. That's all part of the process. So it's just making sure that everyone's informed, involved, and see the benefits. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Some great information there. I really appreciate your time. Um, and does anyone have any questions for Steve right now? Or you know, uh, Yeah, we do have one here, Tracy. Great. Okay. Are there, uh, you referred to the um, problem with the ticks. How about allergy sufferers? Uh, we do get quite a bit of complaints. We do. Uh, good point. Um, same thing. It's just more of an educational piece. Um, so public health is engaged with the tick problem. Uh, they put up signage and whatnot. As far as allergies, we do get the complaints. Uh, we just tell people you got to live with it. I mean, there's really not much we can do about it. This is the kind of the direction that the city's going in. Uh, I think the positive outweigh the negatives and, uh, you know, you just do your best to strategically, um, if you, if you engage the community early enough on, those people I find uh, come to the front and then maybe you can work with them and then pick certain plant material that may help in the long run that maybe don't affect them so much. Uh, otherwise, like I said, strategic locations that aren't so close to housing, um, I find that helps too, right? Like that one example where it was next to the forested area, like it wasn't very close to housing. We do have a large uh, ma maintained park nearby uh, that allows walking, there's trails and whatnot. So it's just having, uh, having those sites available too for the public as well, right? So we have areas that are non-maintained, but having maintained areas available for people who suffer from allergies. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, and thanks for your question. Um, there's a, just there, I think there's a group of uh, Midland staff that are joining from one location. So it seemed like they were passing that around there, but um, do appreciate your question. Um, any other questions at all or? And any questions, uh, especially from operational staff, like you can send them to me. Uh, I'm directly involved. Uh, my staff do the actual grass cutting. Uh, like I said, there's lots of pros and cons and uh, from a maintenance perspective, some stuff that's worked that hasn't, just let me know. Thanks, Steve. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, so we are um, a little bit behind. Um, I have set aside 10 extra, 10 extra minutes at the end for questions. So I think I might um, give people the opportunity just to get up now and take a quick uh, three to five minute break, um, just in case there's anything you need to grab or, or whatnot. And then we'll get back into the um, second part um, where we'll have um, Vicki join us and talk about some um, actual site management um, op opportunities and suggestions that she's gonna uh, share with us. So um, in five minutes, so we'll say, uh, why don't we say four minutes? So we'll see you at 11.15. Thank you. And I'll put a little video on for those of you who aren't able to, to walk away or want to learn a little bit more here.
including butterflies and moths, flies, wasps, birds, bats, and other mammals. But the most important pollinators are bees, which actively collect pollen to feed their young. When you think about bees, the first bee that comes to mind is probably the honeybee, the most common pollinator of many food crops around the world, like almonds, cherries, blueberries, even coffee. The honeybee is one species that was brought to North America with colonists from Europe, but there are actually about 3,600 species of wild bees that are native to the United States and Canada. There are many different groups of native bees that come in all shapes and sizes, from carpenter bees, mining bees, sweat bees, to yellow-faced bees, and more. These wild bees don't just look different from domesticated honeybees, they also live differently. Most of them live solitary lives, with a single female doing all of the work to build a nest, collect pollen and nectar, and lay eggs. Unlike the honeybee, which lives above ground and can be managed in wooden hives, more than two out of three wild bees live underground in nests that can be hard to spot from the surface. Some dig down and lay their eggs several feet below ground, while others make nests near the soil surface. Other bees nest above ground in hollowed out plant stems or tunnels in old snags and logs. But why do we keep hearing about pollinator declines? What does it mean for us? And what can we do about it? Bees and other pollinators are threatened by many environmental stressors. Of these, some of the big ones are habitat loss and degradation, or loss of food sources and nesting areas. Climate change, which will have unpredictable impacts on plants and their pollinators. Pesticide use, which happens in both urban and agricultural areas. And diseases and pathogens, which can in some cases be spread between the managed bees shipped around the country for pollination and the wild bees living around us. So what can we do to help? These are some big problems and some of them need big structural solutions. But the good news is we can all contribute to saving the bees by responding to these big threats, habitat loss, climate change, pesticides, diseases, in our own local communities. When we say save the bees, we're talking about all of the diverse bees living in and around our communities. Honeybees get much of the attention, but they're an actively managed domesticated species, which means the honeybee is actually not at risk of extinction. There are thousands of species of wild living bees that could use our help. If you're wanting to help the bees in your communities, not to mention all the other kinds of pollinators, the best thing you can do is plant flowers. Adding habitat or food and shelter in your yard can make that space a haven for many pollinators. Even small patches or containers with flowering plants can help support the local bees that pollinate I went back there. But anyways, we'll get just start we'll get started just so that we have some enough time to go through each of the um, next guests. So if you wanted to view that uh, presentation at any time, there's uh, that'll be available for you afterwards as well. The link to that if you want to um, take a quick view. It's only a five minute um, video, so really easy but really informative. Um, yeah, so moving forward, um, just want to confirm that uh, Vicky's ready. I didn't want to rush her there. Oh yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks uh, so thank much. You. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So uh, Vicky has been uh, working to protect and prom promote pollinators with pollinator partnerships since 2011. As director, she oversees um, Pollinator Partnership Canada's research and programs, keeping on top of new and emerging um, pollinator issues and managing programs that include pollinator habitat conservation, landscape management assessments, understanding and enhancing agroecosystems, land use and pesticide policy review, and ecosystem service assessment in Canada. Her graduate research fo focused on understanding how native bees use gardens and habitats in cities. 
This focus on pollinators and human dominated landscapes has continued throughout her career. Welcome, Vicki. Uh, please go ahead and I'll just uh, transfer people to you. Thanks so much. Can I scroll to go through the slides, correct? Well, it's, it's a little bit touchy. You can, I think uh, it's probably best to use your uh, space bar or your arrow keys. I'm trying. So click with your mouse on the screen first. Okay, there you go. Now you're, now you're controlling it. And now just use your... Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thanks, everyone. And, and uh, you got a sneak peek at some of my slides when Steve was going through his presentation. So thanks for that as well, Steve. Um, um, I'm here to give you a little bit more of a technical background on some of the aspects of habitat management to support pollinators, really trying to... Uh, goes hand in hand with the efforts you've been doing with your NOMO. And I've, I've been learning just as much from the technical applied side that the municipalities are doing, as you'll learn from my biology, pollinator biology uh, perspective on pollinator management. Um, so uh, just some quick background. Um, I'm the director of Pollinator Partnership Canada. We're a uh, charity focused on protecting pollinators in Canada to support the ecosystems and the ecosystem services they provide, the food that we eat, the landscapes that we benefit from, all of that. Uh, a lot of what we do at Pollinator Partnership is actually being out in nature, in the field, studying these insects, helping to um, install habitats, just really learning more about pollinator systems so that we can produce outreach materials that then engage everyone in helping pollinators. So we actually have a really broad scope of resources available. If you visit our website, um, pollinatorpartnership.ca, they include planting guides for gardeners that list the uh, best native species by ecoregion. We also have technical guidelines that are useful for land managers, either at the municipal or um, corporate level. And we also produce uh, science pieces that help inform policy. Uh, so we really do provide something for every audience because everyone can do something meaningful to support pollinators. And recently, actually, um, in December of last year, we partnered with B City acquiring the administrative side of that program. So, you know, the great program that you're all part of, it's not changing, it's just going to get bigger and better. The back of house is merging with, with us so that we can really promote the work that B City does, um, piggybacking on some of the structure that we have. And Shelly gave you a huge, wonderful overview of B City. And I'll just put a little plug in for one of the programs that we're really trying to promote this year um, is the Pollinator Pledge. So if you're already a Bee City, if you're already doing all of the Bee City stuff, here's a great way to further engage um, your members, your constituents, the community in your municipality. Have them take the Pollinator Pledge. Maybe they're already doing all of this, but it's a nice way to just ratify what you want to do to make it better for pollinators. So make that habitat, make sure it's diverse and blooming throughout the seasons. Don't use pesticides, leave that messy lawn, um, focus on promoting pollinators everywhere and also be really conscious of climate and carbon when you make decisions each day. Perfect, so here's um, jumping in right into the presentation. Here's a shot of um, more of a meadow ecosystem, and this is what pollinators like. Um, and if I go to the next slide and take a look at an aerial view of Southern Ontario, uh, you can see even from this really, you know, 10,000 foot view that we probably don't have a lot of that landscape. We have a lot of concrete and a lot of urbanization, um, agricultural intensification, it's expanding and taking away that natural habitat. We do manage habitats in our cities and municipalities, but it's often in uh, a form that's very manicured. So this again, does not resemble that first photo of what pollinators like. And I'm so encouraged by all of the photos I saw from each of your municipalities about how transitioning to a NOMO or a more habitat conscious way of managing municipal space can look. So 
our goal is to help transition something that's um, not providing benefits to pollinators into something much better. So looking at the science and the technical side of things, from the perspective of a pollinator, when they're in a managed system, they're facing challenges from pesticide use and contamination, which may not be the case in your municipality, but it's, it's just a general fact. Um, they face challenges from mowing. It could be direct mortality. Uh, habitat degradation, so that again can be attributed to mowing, um, fragmentation and invasive species. So all of these factors, if the management isn't done in a pollinator sensitive way, really can further harm the situation for pollinators. So ultimately what we're aiming to do is to instill this idea of restoring, maintaining and enhancing the habitat that you have, which again, it's been made very clear to me that everyone's already on point with. But uh, just to summarize that local site specific actions really do add up to significant change. So if you're going to restore the natural vegetation and habitats that you have, if you're going to maintain those habitats in a way that minimizes disturbance and harm to pollinators, and then if you are able to go a step further using methods that promote pollinator richness and diversity, we're going to have a better landscape for pollinators in the end. So I wanted to take a little time to talk about, again, from the pollinator's perspective, some of the pluses and minuses of mowing, just so as you engage in this practice, build plants, you can think about how a pollinator experiences the landscape and double check if what you're already doing is great on point makes sense or if there's room to make some modifications to make it even better for pollinators. So in terms of mowing, um, there can be direct mortality. Uh, pollinator can be, um, can interact with a mower blade and actually be physically injured. But also the food source that that pollinator is using can be removed as well as invasive species can be spread by mowing. Uh, but on the positive side, mowing actually does support a lot of native plants. Uh, they increase their growth when they are mowed. Often they set down deeper roots. Uh, it also can increase the diversity and the density of floral species. So there's positive and positives and negatives, pardon me. And in terms of best management practices for mowing, uh, you, you know, I'm going to list as many as we have. Some of them are um, suggestions, some of them are tried and tested, and some of them have some science behind them. And some of them are really just us thinking like a pollinator and what we would like to see in a landscape. So the first one is mow less, which we're already very much on board with. Mowing less can mean a bunch of things. It could mean mowing once or twice a year. So again, mowing very little. Uh, it can also mean leaving a clear zone. So actually only mowing a very small portion of the landscape, which is again, what I've seen in a lot of the presentations and is a really great way to approach this combination of maintaining municipal landscaping and having habitat. Another concept of mowing less is to use a rotational mowing concept. So if you're looking at a landscape that doesn't really have public access, but you do want to still maintain the habitat, uh, what we often recommend is mow a third of that each year. So you're reserving two thirds of whatever space you have for pollinators and for habitat, and you're only managing a third. You can also time your mowing so that it's both better for the plant community and less harmful to pollinators. So you want to, uh, for example, um, you could mow early in the season, which actually has been shown to increase growth in milkweed, which then benefits monarchs. So if you do mow milkweed plants early in the year, they grow back thicker and bigger. So there's more food for monarchs. Another point to consider, and some of these may be contradictory. So it is, again, background information you have to take with you and look at the landscape and the situation you're in. But ideally you would mow when plants are past their bloom, so you wouldn't be cutting down floral resources that are needed. Uh, and when caterpillars that are using those plants to feed on have finished their life cycle. So that would be late summer and fall, if that's an option to have a single mowing phase at that time of year, maybe two, maybe one early in the spring and then one in the fall. That's a good idea. Um, 
you also want to mow when it's the right time to control weeds. So you may want to schedule your limited mowing to mow when a weed is best controlled if using mowing, if that's the methodology. You can also adjust your mowing technique. So mowing at slower speeds actually does help pollinators that may be in the vegetation escape mower blades. So they have a little bit more of a chance there. Uh, also setting the mower to five centimeters, that's what's been shown um, through the research to increase the root development in perennial plants. So if you mow to that particular level, you're actually going to have more of a landscape. And of course, this is mowing a habitat to make that habitat better. It's a little bit different in this case than leaving a path of mowed access or turf. Pardon me. And lastly, you can prioritize doing your mowing activities during the day, uh, which you're probably already doing, but in some landscapes um, that we talk to, uh, on particularly hot days, often you might be compelled to mow earlier or later in the day. But if you do mow during the, um, during the day when pollinators and other wildlife are active, they also have an easier chance to get out of the mower's way. So in the end, when we implement these, um, these techniques, we end up with habitats that look like this or all those great photos that you've showed. Uh, previously, where you have a lot of vegetation, it's taller, it's clearly providing habitat resources. Uh, on a hydro corridor, you can have areas that are mowed right next to a path, and then the rest of the landscape, again, is really diverse in size and shape and floral components. Uh, and here's an example, not one of my sites, but a really cool uh, extreme example of a uh, mode walking path with all these patches of unmowed area that really do, do provide wildlife benefits and still easy accessibility and that kind of um, easing in the public to accepting this concept of mowing a little bit less than the messier gardens. Uh, and signage, uh, just like was mentioned over and over again, is really important. So signage taking forms of telling the public that you're not mowing yet, that it is actually part of a maintenance plan. It's just a different maintenance plan or that, you know, it's a pollinator habitat in the making. Um, we have some signs that are available to download as well. In addition to the ones you can get on Bee City to really showcase your habitat as a habitat. <clears throat> um, and what's really, really important is assessing your impact. So I just talked about these best management practices for mowing. But really the science of mowing and making habitat better for pollinators is in its infancy and it really does need more baseline and documentation from municipalities that have taken on the practice. So we really would encourage having baselines, lists of species of interest that you want to promote, uh, a list of weed species that you want to reduce through this modified practice or an inventory or a baseline. And they don't have to be um, you know, double blind scientific monitoring studies where you have an unmowed area and a mowed area, they can be as simple as visual documentation using photo points and treated versus untreated comparisons in the same landscape. Uh, implementing this and monitoring it over time really helps add credibility to what we're promoting here, which is making habitat by adjusting some management practices. Uh, so the last little thing I wanted to add is if you are thinking about making habitat that is designed to promote pollinators, so you can do that through mowing or maybe through active habitat planting, there are a couple tips that um, are supported by science of what bees and butterflies like. So for example, um, bees really do need diverse resources throughout the entire season. They respond better when things are dense when they're in bloom and when the habitat is complex. So there's short things, tall things, um, different types of plants, ones that are more woody, ones that are more herbaceous. And they also need nesting resources, which for them are loosely compacted soil for the species that nest in the ground, as well as the stalks and brambles of plants that are left over. So if you want bees to be really using your habitat, this is something you can consider. For butterflies, it's very similar, but also the fact that host plants are very, very important, such as milkweed, because the caterpillars use them. 
Um, butterflies also seem to favor where edges are uneven, uh, where there's trees in the landscape, as, where, as well as where there's bare patches. And they do need good access to sunlight because they require basking to help raise their body temperature so that they can fly. So if you are mowing with some of these ideas in mind, you actually can help create a better habitat. And the last thing I'll leave you with, um, just again, to keep in the back of your mind how a pollinator uses and perceives your habitat, and then how you might modify some of your techniques is the monarch butterfly life cycle. So we'll go through this and you'll see um, how this might actually impact your choice of when to mow, how often to mow. So a monarch butterfly goes through a series of life stages, including an egg, a caterpillar, a pupa, an adult, uh, and they all use the habitat, and in this case, milkweed. So an egg, a caterpillar, and a pupa will be physically on a milkweed plant through that life cycle. Um, from egg to pupa is about two and a half to three weeks. So at any given time, you have this potential occupancy of your milkweed. So just a little quick shot of what these look like. It's a nice egg there, a nice young caterpillar, some more mature caterpillars eating the milkweed, a shot of the various sizes of caterpillars. So they're, they're relatively obvious, um, pupa. And then finally, an adult. Uh, the adult's the only one that can actually physically get out of your way if you're, if you're mowing. And another complicating factor is that, at least in Ontario, monarchs, they're going to be present in Ontario from about May through to about, I would say September, um, August into September. So when I just told you, well, you wanna make sure that your pollinators are not actively using the habitat before you mow them, and then I present you with the monarch life cycle and the fact that they're there throughout the entire season when we would be doing outdoor maintenance activities, there's a bit of a challenge. So um, it's something that you need to consider when you're doing these activities. And it's the more you know about how the species are using the landscape, the better decision making you can make to time your mowing, choose to mow, to not to mow, to set aside an area. Um, so I really uh, appreciate actually chatting with you and learning about the, the really high level of habitat management that's already ongoing. So hopefully you got a little bit more background on the pollinator side of things from me. And I'm happy to answer questions um, now and offline as well. If something comes to you later, I'm sure Tracy can share my contact information. Yeah, and thanks again. Thank you, Vicki. Lots of great information. Um, does anyone have any questions right now? Or are we, I'll just give you a few seconds or you can send them in the chat if you prefer. Okay, all right. Um, so now we're going to um, move on to, pardon me, sorry. Um, uh, so Michelle uh, Hudelin is going to join us now to speak a little bit more about our local perspective on um, site management and monitoring. So Michelle is our wetlands and habitat biologist at SSEA and she is here to offer further expertise as mentioned on that site ma management and monitoring. And um, I will transfer that over now to Michelle and let you uh, go ahead. Thanks Michelle. Thanks, Tracy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just a very brief introduction of myself uh, for anybody who doesn't know me. Um, I'm a graduate of University of Guelph, so it's great to see some great work happening in Guelph. Uh, and I've been working at SSEA for more than 20 years. Uh, my program responsibilities include providing some technical information and advice on wise stewardship of natural heritage and native species, and also mapping and evaluation of natural heritage features such as woodlands, wetlands, and fish habitats. The previous speakers have done a, a great job of giving some uh, really interesting information on establishing and maintaining, uh, managing pollinator sites and sharing some of the lessons learned over the years. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about monitoring of the Midland sites in particular. Um, as Vicki mentioned, monitoring of the sites is really important and it adds a lot of credibility to the project. It's important to document the progress and the success of the project over time, and also to identify when some intervention or management might be required to help the project along. 
Um, it's essentially going to be monitoring of the plant communities. You don't necessarily need to specifically do surveys for, um, you know, what types of pollinators are using the site, but any incidental observations can be included in that. Um, monitoring can be done by town staff, and you could also consider use of skilled or trained volunteers to, to supplement that. Uh, both Jay and Stephanie, I think, touched on the idea of collaboration and finding partners to work with that can help support the project. Uh, and one of the things we thought about for the Midland example is that uh, you could get some help with your monitoring. You could perhaps pair up a staff person, um, obviously safely with COVID protocols where necessary, but pair somebody up with, uh, you know, a knowledgeable person from the garden club or a horticultural club or the naturalist club. Um, you know, there, there might be some folks there that are able to help with identification of some of the species that the staff might not be familiar with. There's also some uh, citizen science programs that can contribute information to the project, uh, but also, you know, to that wider, uh, those wider initiatives. And there's a few of them. Uh, there's a bumblebee watch, there's a monarch larva monitoring project, and we can provide those resources later. Uh, there's also a project called eButterfly. So there's a number of different um, citizen science initiatives that can provide some supplemental information too. Um, and I think one of the things that Steve mentioned was the site needs to be really well marked um, in advance so that the staff know where to mow and where not to mow. Um, you know, that could be used maybe stakes or flags uh, to, to mark out that site. It could also be very helpful for the people who are making the observations so that they can easily find the site. It's well defined and they know where they should be looking and making their observations. Okay, just uh, to continue on with some monitoring, um, our suggestions for how often to monitor, um, ideally uh, two or three times per year, but a minimum of once per year. Um, if you're able to do it more than, more than once per year, you can capture some of those early and later season plant species. And also, as I mentioned, those incidental observations of different types of pollinators that might be um, on the site. Uh, in terms of when to monitor, obviously at the beginning of the project is quite important, and I think Stephanie mentioned that too, take lots and lots of pictures. Uh, you know, what do you already have there on the site, including potentially invasive species, which Tamara is going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, what native species could be added or could, should be added. Uh, make sure that your monitoring is coordinated with any planned mowing activities. Um, you know, obviously you want, if you're, if you're wanting to go out and take a look at some of those plants, you want to make sure that happens before they're mowed because it's pretty hard to identify them when uh, they're little, <laughs> short, short little stalks. So there'd be some good uh, coordination required among your staff as well. If you're doing monitoring two or three times a year, we would suggest the uh, timing such as sort of mid-June, mid-July and mid-August. If you're only able, able to do it once per year, you might look at the end of July or early August to try and capture sort of the most of the growing season, but again, tie it back to when the planned uh, mowing activities are to take place. There's lots of species that are uh, much easier to identify during the growing season when they got leaves and, and flowers present, and that's why that uh, frequency, if you can do it two or three times a year, just makes it a little bit easier to identify some of those plants. And then in terms of how to monitor, uh, Vicki mentioned photo monitoring, you know, you go to a specific location and you take pictures from the same but uh, year after year, looking at it over time. It's very helpful to have something to line up in each shot. So uh, depending on your site, you know, maybe you've got a really um, distinct looking tree or a building in the background. Um, if you don't have anything else, you know, a pole or something could be installed um, if there's nothing else available to help you um, frame your photos from year to year. Um, you want to take some photos before the site is altered and then lots of pictures during the project implementation and also during the various stages of management. And that can be targeted surveys to document plants, um, but as I said, you know, those incidental observations of what pollinators are using the site, and that could be, you know, it doesn't have to be a detailed um, tax taxonomical identification of bees down to species. It could be, you know, are you seeing bees? Are you seeing butterflies and moths? Are you seeing hummingbirds? You know, those types of observations. And it's also important to track what's been planted as part of the establishment or the management. So that could include, you know, not just the types of species that are planted, but also the quantities and, and what growing stage they were at. So was it seed that was broadcast or was it a potted plant that was, uh, that was planted that has a, a better survival rate? Um, and also doc document how successful it was in establishing, you know, did you get good survival rate? 
or um, were there any inter interventions required, for example, invasive species control that have been used on the site? SSEA has developed uh, two templates that the pound can use for monitoring. One is for native species and one is for invasive species. I won't go into a lot of detail here, uh, but we can help support the staff uh, as needed by providing the sheets and, and any um, information on their use. They do have some standard data, such as the location of the site, the date and the name of the observers. Uh, we've made it simple, so there's some check boxes for some of the common or expected species of trees and shrubs, uh, vines, grasses, and wildflowers. And then there's also space where um, the observers can note how abundant the species is. You know, for example, is it a single plant of a, an invasive species that needs to be tackled? Or is it a dense patch of, of a native species that we're really great, uh, you know, glad to see? And it's the dominant cover. Um, and then you can also, there's space to include the approximate area of coverage. Um, the, in terms of monitoring, the staff and volunteers should ideally provide these field sheets to SSCA, so keep a copy for yourselves. But if you provide them to us as soon as possible after they're completed, that will help to keep us informed about the project and allow for any recommended follow-up if needed. And again, just to reiterate, take lots of pictures, especially if you're unfamiliar with the species, the people who are doing the monitoring, or they're unsure about a positive, positive identification. Uh, you know, not just those landscape type shots that are used for the, the photo monitoring and the documentation of the site itself, but some more specific pictures of the, uh, the species that might be giving a little bit of trouble in terms of identification. Um, you know, if, especially if it's a suspected invasive species, um, keep these pictures with the data sheets and SSEA um, may be able to help confirm the identification. And I'm going to turn it over to Tamara, who is going to talk more about invasive species, uh, which will no doubt be a challenge at uh, most of these pollinator sites. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so I'm just going to make sure I have control here. I think I do. Um, so I know that we're nearing the end of the workshop, so hopefully we can hold your attention for a few moments longer. Um, as uh, some of the other presenters talked about, one of the challenges that you'll likely come across on these sites are invasive species. Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the invasive species considerations. Um, before we get into that, I'm just going to give you a background on the invasive species program if you're not already familiar with it. So uh, the goal is to reduce the ecological, uh, economic, and social impacts of invasive species through prevention, monitoring, management, and education. Um, so some of the services that are available to you is um, we facilitate monitoring and management programs. Um, we collaborate with local, provincial, and national organizations to develop best management practices and share information and resources. Um, as you probably know, invasive species do not respect municipal boundaries, um, so it's most effective when we're working together on management. Um, we also educate municipal staffs and the community on identification impacts and uh, management of invasive species. And then finally, we empower the community to take action by supporting them um, with management events, community events, and um, workshops. Um, so to give you a bit of background on, on what invasive species are, um, so first of all, non-native species are any species that are introduced outside of their natural or past uh, distribution, and this is through um, human or uh, natural related means. Um, and then invasive species are, or also referred to as non-native invasive species, are just invasive species that um, fit the same definition, but they also have some sort of threat to the ecosystems, economy, society, and or human health. Um, typically invasive species are fast growing. Um, they outcompete native vegetation and they also can deter pollinators and they usually have a lack of natural controls. So for the Midland sites, um, I suggest considering non-native and invasive species for removal to promote the growth of um, some native species. To uh, reiterate here, this is just a flowchart to, to help you distinguish between native, non-native, and invasive species. Um, so in many cases, uh, there's a potential risk for non-native species to become invasive. And a perfect example of this is periwinkle, which was an or introduced as an ornamental plant and um, became invasive when it escaped uh, gardens and landscaping. 
Uh, many non-native and invasive species are still readily available at garden centers and nurseries, so just be aware of that. Um, so here is an example of how an invasive species can affect pollinators. Um, so dog strangling vine refers to two invasive vines that are actually a member of the milkweed family. And as Vicky already talked about, um, monarch butterflies use milkweed to lay their eggs and complete their life cycle. Um, they, they hatch and they feed on milkweed. They will also hatch on, um, they will lay their eggs and hatch on dog strangling vine. However, dog strangling vine does not provide an adequate food source for um, monarchs and they will not survive. Dog strangling vine also has a tendency to grow in dense populations and it can displace native milkweed. So it's an example of um, how uh, invasive species can deter pollinators and um, outcompete native vegetation. Um, so a general approach that you can follow um, on the Midland sites is to identify any non-native or invasive species through monitoring. Um, so as Michelle already mentioned, we've developed monitoring sheets to make it easier for staff and volunteers to identify and record some of these invasive species. Um, and if you identify invasive species on site, uh, it's you can plan your management approach. So um, remove species based on best management practices, and those practices will differ among species depending on the plant's biology. Um, and uh, SSEA is also here to support you with resources and um, information on, on removal. Um, then uh, after you plan your best management practices, you can remove and dispose of species. And um, just keep in mind that invasive species are very persistent and it's not going to be a one-time thing. So it's very likely that you'll need to remove or manage them more than once. And you can follow that same approach again. Um, if by chance you don't find invasive species on the site, then um, just focus on preventing them for, from being introduced there. Um, there are a number of resources available online to support identification. And some, some of the applications that you can use are iNaturalist or Google Lens, which is something you can actually download to your mobile device and take in field with you. Um, you can take a picture of a plant species and then um, it'll actually provide a list of suggestions on what it thinks those species are. Um, or you can take a picture and then um, bring it to the application on your internet browser. There's also a number of websites that some of the other presenters discussed um, that you can go online and they, they have um, support with native and invasive plant identification. And then in addition to this, um, we will be providing support. So after this workshop today, we're gonna follow up with a list of resources um, and some field guides that are available online that you can print and take in, in onto the site with you. Um, and then we'll also be providing a list of common invasive species found in Midland, as well as um, how to identify some of those species with a fact sheet. And again, um, I'm here, I'm, I'm available as a resource. So um, as I said, the Invasive Species Program works on um, helping with identification and monitoring and management of some of these species. So um, you can always uh, email or leave me a voicemail and I can be of help to you. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Tracy now. Thanks, Tamara. Perfect. All right. So um, thanks, everyone. Uh, just to finish up, I just want to talk quickly for five minutes just about um, some of the resources and tools that are being made to available to you um, as part of this project. And I just wanted to stress again, I know most of our guests have talked about um, engagement, engagement, communication getting people together and how important that is to the success of this project. Um, you know, number one, we can't do it alone and it's just more fun when there's more people involved. So, um, so as part of this project, uh, I know that um, from in 2020, um, there was some pilot sites initiated and there was already some initial pushback to um, the NOMO pilot sites that you had implemented. Um, so part of that, and you know, we go to, you know, even the allergy question or the sting question, something like that. Um, you know, educating people early on and clear and consistently is really important to the success of this program. Um, so in order for you to do that, I just wanna let you know, as I said, about a few of the resources that will be made available to you. Um, so 
Uh, we've been working with uh, Randy, as I said earlier, earlier, to develop some resources and provide some information, um, both for you and for the public. Um, so this is uh, on, you'll see to the left there on the bottom, um, the B-City uh, Canada site uh, web page that uh, Randy and I have been working on to, uh, where is somewhere that you can send people when they have questions about the program. Um, or whether you have questions about the program yourself. We've also um, in there put some handy FAQs, which I know are really helpful, just some pretty straightforward, clear, consistent answers that um, you know, are in response to some of those common questions. Uh, we'll also be working on um, a fact sheet that'll be made available, uh, whether digitally or in print, we're still working on that. Um, again, we understand the importance of signage and that these sites be marked and identifiable, um, both for you and for members of the public. Uh, B City also has some amazing resources available on their webpage, which includes some brochures that are available for print um, that can be provided to people and even placed in your town vehicles for when the day um, you know comes again that people feel comfortable approaching each other in public. Um, and again, we can always um, you know we have links to B City Canada as well as Pollinator Partnership on that website on your respective uh, uh, town site. Um, but you can also send people there as well to access resources, to take the pollinator pledge, um, to uh, maybe print out, print some activities for, for your kids or your family or things like that. There's lots of resources available. And so um, just some examples, I'm not gonna go over these very, very much. It's just, you know, some common questions that you may be, you may experience. For example, um, someone approaches you while you're out and about, and said, why are you not mowing this park anymore? It looks unkempt, it's messy, we want it mown. And then, you know, you can be proudly just say, you know, our, the town is a B-City municipality. We've implemented a pilot project to evaluate um, how we can support pollinators, reduce our carbon footprint and save some money. So if, if they have more questions, you can send them directly to your own website where there'll be resources. And as well, we're gonna provide you with some print resources um, or link to print resources that can be made available in your in your trucks and your vehicles that are actually uh, you're using to access the site. So just a few key points um, to finish up. Uh, pollinators are struggling because of different uh, stressors and challenges. Um, by joining the Bee City program, the town has made a commitment to help. You are obviously um, a part of that. Um, so some opposition or pushback to this program is normal. And over time, this will dissipate just with providing that clear and consistent um, it may take some time for these sites to look as colorful and as healthy and as vibrant as some of the sites that you've seen some images of. Uh, we may need to consider um, some human intervention, like adding some native plants and seed, which is why the monitoring and the evaluation of the sites is very important, as well as the, all those pictures, 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 pictures. Uh, resources are available to educate and inform um, stakeholders. So uh, I just went over those and the town is the leader of this project and we look forward to working with you. So other than that, I just wanted um, uh, to say um, thank you very much to all the guests today. I really appreciate your time. Um, I think there was some great information shared. Uh, there's, as I said, um, this will be shared with you afterwards. So all of these links and all these resources and the contact information in a few points called today, uh, you can always reach out to them directly or you can reach out to myself or to Michelle or to Tara about any of your, your local questions. And um, also I'll be sending out a quick survey, um, of course, after the event. So if you do have the opportunity to fill it out, we just wanna get your feedback on, um, on this specific event and maybe ask if there's uh, something you'd be interested in learning more about. So uh, thank you again, everyone. And just uh, like to ask um, if there's any more questions, you're, you're welcome to present those now as we have a few, a few minutes remaining. Questions? I don't. Does anyone? Have, I don't have a question, but just a just a comment. Um, so, in my experience, B City, a lot of people uh, think if they're a B City, they should be able to have honeybees in their backyard. Most people think the only pollinator is a honeybee, and uh, and incorrectly, they think that by having honeybees, they're somehow helping the pollinators. So, that's sort of a, you know maybe a fault of the media and and all the attention on on the honeybee. Um, so. 
Uh, it's so again, it's important to educate ourselves on how, how many different pollinators there are. And probably in your area, there might be 200 or 250 different kinds of species of bees. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is about stinging. Um, some people will say, well, if you're putting in pollinator gardens, then, oh my, you know, my son's allergic and, you know, there's going to be more bee stinging. Well, the problem is people don't know the difference between a bee and a wasp. And, and their, uh, their behavior patterns as well. Bees are usually very non-aggressive unless they feel very threatened. And a lot of bees don't even have stingers. So again, it's part of education, what we were talking about, um, but maybe those issues will come up, those questions will come up and, and just to have answers for those. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shelley. I think that's something to consider, um, you know, with our with our site. Um, well, with the town site, um, that page that we now have available. If we find that a question like that is um, needs to be addressed, then we do have kind of that platform now that we can try and address that and, and get that communication there. Um, so I just have a, a question from Andy Campbell at the town. So I'm just gonna let him ask that question. Hi, Andy. Hi. Well, I'd just like to thank you, Tracy, for organizing this event, uh, helping educate our staff and anyone else who's on the call today, and to all the participants. This is one of the challenges as we try and uh, become better environmentalists, that uh, it's different, it's a change, and some people like their manicured lawns and parks. So this is going to be a bit of a struggle for us. We saw a little bit of it last year. And uh, I think some of the guidance today from the other municipalities and from SSEA staff will really give us some tools to help us move ahead. So uh, thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you. Thanks for uh, joining the Bee City program. It's great. It's um, looking forward to working together with the town. Great. So if there's uh, any more questions, I don't, uh, I don't see any. Just let me double check my... I see no hands up. I see nothing. Okay. Well, thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. And um, yes, we'll be sending that information out to you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Have a great day. Thank you.